Hun. I'm Jin Chi, and together with my team, Charles, Vikram, and Vinod, we welcome you to Troublemakers Assembly, organized by the Design School at Taylor's University. Since the inception of Troublemakers Manifesto in 2019, this is the second time the Troublemakers are conducting such an event. This year, we call it Troublemakers Assembly, and it will be in a series of e-conferences running once a month from July to November. Without troublemakers, there would be limited or no new ways of thinking and seeing, or worse, no new discovery, leading to unimproved life and unenlightened minds. Troublemakers Assembly is thus a gathering to honor and learn from the inspirational work done by an array of engaging personalities who have, in their own unique ways, made a mark in society through creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. Troublemakers Assembly aims at creating audience immersion through an active and meaningful content with the end objective of inspiring the audience to become their very own troublemakers. Before we begin, I would like to remind all tailored staff who have joined us here to register at HRSS if you have not already done so, to record your CPD hours, and also please register your attendance by clicking on the link provided in the Troublemakers Assembly Facebook page and the live feed. For non tailor staff, you do not have to do this. To all who are attending this e-conference, please take a survey we have prepared for you so we can get your suggestions for future improvement. The survey link will be provided in our Troublemakers Assembly Facebook page shortly. Don't forget to like and share our page and our live feed. Now, let me formally introduce our speaker for this month, Ms. Natasha Muhammad Hishamuddin. Besides being a speaker, trainer and educator in the field of creative pedagogy, creative arts and communications, Natasha is also the CEO of Gahara and a member of the Malaysian Craft Council. The title of her presentation this evening is High Spirits, Discussing the Realm of Spirituality in Local Arts and Crafts. Before I pass the session over to the speaker, I encourage everyone to post at least one question for Natasha in our live feed during or towards the end of her presentation, as we would love to hear from each of you. Thank you. Let us now welcome Ms. Natasha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the team at the, behind the Troublemakers Assembly. Uh, calling me on board is definitely troublemaking. And um, as mentioned by Jing Chi, I lead a social impact company based in Kampung Penambang, Kelantan, that specializes in producing artisanal batik. And as an exco member of the Mission Craft Council, uh, what we do is we go around to institutions and uh, we work with various agencies to re-educate the public on the cultural and heritage values of local arts and craft. And one of the things that normally raise eyebrows in, in what we do is when we talk about uh, the, the topic of spirituality. And I'm quite happy to share with you on that today. Um, but I would like to also uh, remind you uh, to have an open mind <laughs> on what I'm going to share with you. Um, because like when we talk about batik, for example, yeah, um, what normally uh, make us disruptors in our industry is when we tell them that uh, the batik that you're holding is pretty much haunted. And that normally either makes them want to buy more batik or make them want to walk away from batik. But you can't deny the fact that um, batik has a very fascinating story behind it. But for today's session, I would like to sort of like share a little bit more about not just batik, but about local arts and craft, because they're all interrelated. When we talk about spirituality, they're pretty much connected. But I have to also um, touch on a little bit about history 
because um, when we talk about the local arts and craft and spirituality, I have to take you back to at least 2000 years. And um, although this is just a very short session tonight, but I'll take you back as far as necessary for you to understand um, this discussion. Uh, so it was only in 1909 that Kelantan, Terengganu, Kedah and Perlis was actually handed over from Siam to um, to the British. And so before that, we were pretty much under the heavy influence of Siam and their cultures. And they dabble a lot in, in spirituality until today. Uh, but we are also heavily influenced by Java, uh, which is Indonesia. And a lot of our local arts and craft is pretty much in influenced and if not inspired by by the Javanese local arts and craft. So, and uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, Thai and uh, Indonesian, I mean, what we call them today, um, local arts and craft and spirituality, you'll know that they're, they're very much into, into animism and uh, a lot of what they, they practice and what they believe until today has to do with the fact that Buddhism and Hinduism has been very, very instrumental in in the, what do you call it? In the history of the Southeast Asian Basin. So what happened was when it came to uh, Malaya, yeah, so we sort of like disconnected ourselves because Islam um, came into, into the area and um, thanks to the traders. So that sort of like created a, disconnected, a disconnection because um, so Islam sort of like, you know, moved us away from the animism and the Hindu and Buddhist um, uh, teachings, yeah? But um, I would like to sort of like touch on the fact that um, so much of what we still have today is because of this fluid influence, yeah, from these two, two nations, Thai and, uh, Indo uh, Thailand and Indonesia. So... A very simple example would be um, Kuda Kepang, which we have uh, in Johor. It's actually Kuda Lumping in, in Indonesia. And then we have um, Wayang Kulit, which is you know, accompanied by Gamelan, which again is um, an assemble of musical instruments that comes heavily from, from Java, from Indonesia, and of course, Batik. But uh, what has happened today is that um, because of imperialism, uh, they divided us. Uh, and um, so each Southeast Asian country was adopted by a European influence. So what has happened is um, we became disconnected and so much of what used to be, you know, that fluid connectivity that the local arts and crafts shared in Southeast Asia became pretty much territorial and unfortunately also politicized. And in Malaysia today, uh, especially um, after independence, um, a lot of influence in the way we, we um, practice our local arts and craft is also influenced by the federal constitution, which places Islam as the national religion. And so a lot of uh, traditional aspects of local arts and craft has either been diluted or even removed. A good example is Mat Yong. Uh, although Mat Yong was banned and now it has been sort of like re reinstated, but um, only male performers are allowed to participate. But, um, but what has happened also is that um, the younger generation has very little idea on what makes uh, local arts and crafts so unique. So let me just go into the spiritual aspects of the local arts and crafts. So what's so unique about it? Well, it's the kind of stuff that goes bump in the night. And one of the reasons why I am so in, in love and fascinated with local arts and crafts is because of the spirituality. Now, when I'm talking about spirituality, I'm talking about the ghosts and the, you know, all the hauntings. That That is, you must also separate the Western media influences, yeah. But I'm talking about um, how we, at one time, we were very much um, influenced by our environment, by the natural elements. And um, our ancestors were worshippers of the elements, the sun, the wind, the rain. 
and until today, especially in batik production, yeah, a lot of the the beauty, the outcome of a batik depends on the elements. Yeah, I will expand a little bit more on that later on. Yeah, so back then, all things that are alive with the spirits of the ancestors, you know, were pretty much considered as spiritual. And um, please take note that when I say spiritualism, it has got nothing to do with one god or many gods or religion. The two separate aspects altogether. So when it comes to um, spiritualism, we're talking about the connection between us as individuals, as humans, with nature. And when we talk about worshipping the elements, worshipping the spirits of the realm, we're talking about paying respect and homage to our ancestors. Yeah, that is something that needs to be highlighted. Yeah, we're not talking about worshipping a pagan god and so forth. And that is one of the things that has created a massive misconstruction in, in understanding Batik, yeah? Okay, and um, the other thing would be so much of arts and craft uh, was inspired by rituals that supported the, the worshipping or the, the, what do you call it, the celebration of these ancestors. For example, the musical instruments uh, like gamelan, you know, it was very, part, it was all part of rituals. Um, and for example, dance performances. Now dance performances, you know, together with gamelan, put it together and it's sort of like it was believed to conjure deities as part of celebrating again the spirits of the ancestors yeah um and then body movements body gestures yeah we, for example the finger the way you 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 curve your finger is called the mudra yeah these things actually have symbols and i think in western literature you study under semiotics yeah so even sounds sounds were converted into chantings and prayers so all of these things were actually what made local arts and craft um, unique yeah so we, now we come to the spiritual dilemma so if that was pretty much was practiced back then so what happened was as i mentioned earlier when the british came and then islam came into the into the picture so the way it was practiced in, in Southeast Asia, so like changed a little bit. Um, but when it comes to Malaya, uh, it it a lot, yeah. And um, it's interesting because um, if you read um, all literature about Southeast Asia, um, you will know that uh, you'll come across this term called the Malay world. Now, the Malay world is actually the combination of two kingdoms, which is Today, in today's time, it would be Malaysia and Indonesia. Yeah. And back then, um, the Malay kingdom or the Malay world was known as the land below the wind. Yeah. And um, so what has happened is that, so Malaysia, we adopted, you know, the Malayness as, one, as, as wholeness for the entire nation. But Indonesia, they only take the Malayness as one aspect of many other elements that makes up the entire country so you can see yeah so malaysia we adopted malayness entirely as a, for the whole nation and then it's just one tiny component for indonesia so that's already the starting point of how we we diverge yeah and so um what has happened is um in malaysia um the germinating landscape of politics made things a little bit more territorial than other countries in Southeast Asia. So you don't see the same thing happening with local arts and crafts in Thailand, in Myanmar, in Laos, and uh, in Indonesia. Uh, in Malaysia, um, spiritualism is often misunderstood as the mystics and uh, practices connected to cults. And anything that's got to do with that is haram. So that is where things get a little bit more muddied, yeah. So, because uh, now what you have after independence is that there is a rift between classical Malaya, which encompasses 2,000 years of history, which I just shared with you, and Neo-Malaysia, and that would be Islam and the federal constitution. So, um, if you want to know more about these things, feel free to, to you know, um, let me know. I, I'll do, I'll, you know, I'll probably have a separate section on that one but tonight I'm not going to uh, dwell too much on the historical historical aspect but it, it is important for you to have at least a background understanding 
on, on this. So I'm going to go now into examples of several local arts and crafts and how spiritualism comes into the picture. Okay, and this is the part where you need to have a bit of an open mind and, and then and don't get scared. Uh, trust me, it's fascinating. Yeah, I have not shared this with people and, and, and they're like, oh my God, you know, I don't want to know any more about this. So far, the each time I share this with people, they're like, wow, I didn't know this. And I, I, I'm beginning to appreciate more about local arts and crafts. So let's start with Kuda Kepang. So Kuda Kepang is actually, um, if you are familiar with uh, Johor culture, it is actually where you see groups of men and they are uh, they, they go around with this, um, what do you call it? The design of a horse, yeah? And they, they look like horse riders. And this horse, this, this uh, creation of horse, um, artistic creation of horses are made of um, leather and it's painted on. And um, now that's very important. That's another element why a lot of these were, became haram because they used um, animal skin, yeah? Animal and leather and so forth. So. Uh, but that's actually very important because um, that is how spiritualism is connected. I will like I'll explain in a minute. So Kuda Kepang is actually a, a ritualistic performance to celebrate warriors on horses. So you will have a Tokbomo. A Tokbomo will officiate the ceremony. Now, in local arts and crafts, uh, performances are usually involved in it. So although Kuda Kepang is a form of craft, it's also a form of art and it's a form of performance. So you can see how it's all kind of like fused together. You can't separate one from the other. You can't you cannot talk about local art separate without connecting it to a form of craft and a form of performance. So Kuda Kepang is a combination of all three. It is of, it's usually uh, officiated by a Tokbomo a Tokbomo is like a spiritual master, yeah. And what he does is he will um he will conjure, he will sort of like there's a lot of invocation and incantation that is a form of uh, a calling out to deities, spirits, yeah. And so these horse riders will go into a trance and um performances will be uh, according to the rhythm and the tempo of the musician yeah so the puklang gendang and all that yeah so all of this will work into play so slowly rhythmically the beating of the drums will get faster and faster and then these horse warriors will get into a crazier frenzy and this is where the the, the term night shift came out it really go into a, a higher state of mind, yeah? And so what has happened is spirits have gone into these warriors, yeah? So the body of the riders are just now vessels. And so the performances together with the music, yeah? Because Gamela music is haunting, yeah? Gamela music has its own story of spiritual elements in there. And then what will happen is they will go into a, a frenzy to a point where they will actually, they can even eat glass. Now, this is quite identical to Kavadi during uh, Taipusam, yeah? Where they can pierce themselves and not feel anything. It's the same thing. So what happens is um, you will have these warriors and they'll just go crazy, yeah? Layman's term. And then they will, they're even able to eat glass, yeah? And to show how they are completely not disconnected, but connected with the element. Now, the mind, body, and the element have become one to the point where anything is possible. Yeah. So the top bomo is responsible in ending the ceremony, so the spirits will come out of this, of the warriors, and then they will not remember what has happened. Yes. And yes, we we have that in Johor, but uh, from the way I described it, you probably can understand why it's banned. But it was, it is, it is. Um, from Java, and uh, until today, it is practiced exactly as how I explained. But if you go to the village, you go if you know some of these um, Tokbomos, and if you are lucky, you actually get invited to to watch to witness these performances. That's one of the things that I like to do, actually. Yeah, um, I like to be invited to these kind of uh, ceremonies. It's it's 
it's a game changer. But it's fascinating, yeah? Because what you are watching, what you're witnessing is something that's been going on for over 2,000 years. Yeah? And then uh, the other one would be... Um, Wayang Kulit. Now, Wayang Kulit, you know, uh, it's it's a shadow puppet. Yeah, um, you have that. You have like um, the, the Tot Dalang. So the Tot Dalang is the puppeteer. But what people often not know is that the, the puppeteer is also a spiritual master. So the the role of a Tot Dalang, eh, sorry, the role of a puppeteer, yeah, is actually um very very important. Yeah. But Wayang Kulit has so many uh, versions. We only know one type. Wayang Kulit is the generic term for the art. We have Wayang Beber, Wayang Klite, Wayang Gole, Wayang Toping, and Wayang Wong. So many. Yeah. But they're all identical in terms of spirituality, where, yeah, again, it uses uh, animal height. So that's one of the reasons why it's quite. You know, um, it's quite controversial here in Malaysia you know, because, according to Islam, it's 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 haram, yeah. But uh, again, the when they are playing, you know, shit. So in some of these uh, performances, you will have the the puppets together with human interaction, yeah. But again, yeah, the what you will have is the dalang, the puppeteer, will come into the picture and he will conjure. So as he's telling you the story, he's actually conjuring spirits to come in and that is what makes people very much you know hypnotic with the performance now one of the th one of the ways to know that you are already being influenced by this whole you know new level of vibration is when you listen to gamelan music yeah again which will accompany wine collet and you will realize that your movement your body is automatically swaying like this um so this is actually a, a very natural way of your body responding to this whole ritualistic performance, which is why a lot of people are scared to attend these performances. Because if you go to Bali, for example, there's a lot of performances where you see performers in a trance, yeah? And in traditional dance performances, especially the ones performing kraton in palaces, the feet of the dancers will even be slightly raised from the floor. Yes, uh, there, there is a space between the ground and your feet. Yeah, so it sounds scary. I can understand. But that is what makes it so unique because, again, the human body is just a vessel. And what is moving the performance is actually the combination of the spirits in, in the human body with the elements and all that. So when I say elements, this includes, for example, positioning of the planets and full moon a lot of traditional performances are done during full moon so the, the calendar is completely different to a normal uh, corporate fiscal calendar so a lot of performances can be found to during full moon and a lot of these performances are performed outdoors and i will explain to you why because gamelan a complete assemble of gamelan music cannot be performed in a close um, theater because the vibration and the sounds and each instrument has its own spiritual um, deity uh, to guard it, yeah. And so it gets so it gets so overwhelming. So if you ever go to uh, places or uh, kraton or palaces, and you can see there will be one special section, but there'll be in the middle of a huge hall, no walls, yeah, where all the instruments will be kept. Yeah, and this is the part that I love the most. And it is so spiritual when it comes to gamelan instruments. You know, they all have the, its own spirit. That There are certain nights in a year that the instruments will play by itself. You actually hear music coming. Yeah. And local people can hear the music. Yeah, that's why it's, it's open. Yeah. And uh, if you don't get goosebumps from this, I don't know what, but that's what I love about it. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Yeah. And um, so that's one reason why Gamelan cannot be played in a closed room. It's, it's just the vibration, the energy and the haunting is just so much. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other thing that uh, you can also read about this in a lot of literature, a lot of research that has been done by Westerners. You'd be surprised. 
that a lot of our Western artists have also kind of like observed and, and been fascinated with our local uh, arts and crafts. Batik, yeah, uh, is another thing that I would like to talk about where spiritualism and batik is like hand in glove and um, a lot of people don't, don't they are not aware of it. So batik is a form of resistant art and uh, it's just a technique. Batik doesn't belong to any country. There's no such thing as, when we talk about Indonesian batik as opposed to batik as a technique that is used in South Africa, in Japan, even in China, we're talking about the technique and the motif design and the composition of the motif. Yeah, we're not saying that batik belongs to Indonesia. However, batik is more popularly connected to Indonesia because number one, the history is such the amount of research and literature that has come out from from Indonesia on batik, yeah, written by local experts as well as foreign experts, yeah. In Malaysia, you can count how many experts that actually talk about our local arts and craft um, the way I do because again, it's a you know, it puts him in a dilemma: should I go down this rabbit hole or you know, and get into trouble or not? So they tend to sort of like avoid it. But in Indonesia, they, they still look up to it and practice um, the, the production, the rituals, the practices, exactly as how I just explained, which is what your ancestors have been practicing. And don't forget also the, the population, the number of, you know, the, 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 the vast population plays a role as well. Yeah, but um, Batik uses wax. Uh, and the, when you have a block, a block, yeah, you dip into hot wax or you use a chanting where you dip it into hot wax. The moment the copper metal, the copper meets the wax and touches the fabric, that is where you are transferring a soul, a spirit, sorry, a spirit to the fabric. Before that, the fabric has no spirit has no, and when we say no spirit, it means it has no energy. Yeah. And so batik uh, is very uh, important uh, to be respected when you wear it because batik has different uh, purpose. Yeah. So you have batik motifs, composition that's designed for going to war. Um, it's also, that's also for um, re um, ceremonies. Weddings, funerals, circumcision, yeah. And bati is a form of communication. So, for example, there are bati composition that tells you that I am single and available, that I am married and unavailable, I'm a widow available, I'm a widow unavailable. And if you go to Kraton palaces, you know, the different designs, uh, the motif of bati will signify social status and the position of where you are patient in a palace, yeah? And also the different generation of, of a royal family, for example. And um, it is so, uh, the, the, the spiritual connection with the motif is such that um, in Indonesia, there are certain motifs and composition that only royal families can wear and commoners cannot. Because it's not just about print anymore. It's about the, the spirit that comes with the print, yeah. So that is why if to wear batik, you know, you, you have to be very mindful. And Gahara, my company, we specialize in artisanal batik. And one piece of batik is, um, is what do you call it? It goes through up to maybe four artisans. So can you imagine the energy coming from four people, you know, uh, to produce um, a four meter fabric. But batik has to be worn with regality, with sophistication, and with a lot of respect. In fact, the older the batik is, um, especially if you are buying a second-hand batik, my recommendation is after you 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 remove it, you should mandi bunga. So uh, a simple ritual would be um, to, uh, as a final, you have a shower as a final rinse, is to to mix a pillow of water with, um, what do you call it? Um, you cut a root lime yeah and um you sort of like say a, a simple prayer for protection and then you do 
uh, a couple of rinses, yeah. And that, so again, is a form of not just to, to sort of like uh, appease your mind, like, because you don't know where the batik has come from, yeah, and who has worn it, what kind of energy, what kind of personality, yeah. Uh, that is why uh, in the Malay culture, if the batik is used to cover um, a coffin, it, it has to be unstitched. So unstitched batik, you can automatically know that it's, you know, if it's a, an old batik unstitched, there's a high chance it would use to cover a coffin. So you would all use that to to make into into clothes. Um, so th these are the, the things that you need to understand. And um, a lot of people, when I talk to them about this, they say, it sounds crazy. So I am a disruptor of peace when it comes to educating people about local arts and craft. But if you talk to anybody within the community of arts and craft, when when we get together, we're like a house on fire, you know. Yeah, and in fact, we we would invite each other to go for certain rituals and so forth. Again, it has nothing to do with you know religion, but it's the fact that we are celebrating uh, an ancient practice. And I think to be alive and to be able to witness something that's been around for two thousand years is an honor. Yeah, and as well as it's a form of paying respects to my ancestors. I have ancestors who are from Thailand, so I'm half Thai. So that is another reason why I truly believe in this. And I also have, uh, you know, um, uh, descendants from India. So that puts my one foot into another another area where, again, spirituality is, is such, yeah? Um, before I wrap up, I just want to highlight one thing, yeah? If you go to Prabhanan, Borobudur, or if you were to travel across uh, Bali and you were to look at the sculptures, yeah, on the walls of temples, Look out for one character that looks like myth. Yeah, and it will be a character that's pretty much like, uh, it looks as if the, this person is holding a sword in a seated position um, and um, in, a lower, in a lower position compared to the other characters. And that will be the animatic blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith is a very, very important person in 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 um, traditional arts and craft because they make the kris the kris is what is known as the sacred sword in in southeast asian literature and when a blacksmith is making the kris he's also bestowing a spiritual power so only so a blacksmith can actually do that so what i'm trying to say is in traditional look uh, uh, in traditional arts and craft, the people who are behind this craft and art are among the most powerful people and the most profound people in the kingdom, which is very different to today. Today, you probably wouldn't want your children to be a, a batik maker or you wouldn't be crazy about your your son or your, your daughter wanting to study you know, being or wanting to become a silversmith, yeah? Uh, so let alone a blacksmith. But if you if you see if you travel to Europe, there are still communities that are, they take a lot of pride in this kind of occupation. But one of the things that I like to encourage people, and this is where I come in as a disruptor of artistic peace, I really want to recommend the younger generation to consider looking back into these occupations, because to study this artistry, to, to study local arts and craft. Back in the day, there isn't any colleges that you can apply to. You have to seek for a guru. We call them the Adi Gurus, the master craftsmen. And the Adi Guru will have to see whether or not you are qualified, not in terms of your grades, no such thing as that, but in terms of whether or not you have the virtues, the disposition, yeah, to be able to carry on, to be, to be taught. Yeah. So today, uh, people, there they are people who are still active in us in craft, like my creative director, Nick Faiz. He comes from a family of batik, batik making. So there are, so if you come from a family that used to produce a form of craft or art, you're very lucky. You are among the most, um, you are uh, a gifted person, actually, yeah? So for, for design students out there, do not look down at your ability to produce art just because people say it's hard to make an income. 
you must understand the value that you have is so profound you know and 2000 years ago you are one level below the kings uh, below the royalty because you are so important because you are the people that create that produce things now we call them artifacts that connect human to the to the natural element without this there is a disconnect between humans and the elements uh, and the role of spirituality in local arts and craft is to connect both to become one and that is the importance of local arts and craft and the whole pursuit of it is so that we continue to produce all these, um, whether it's performances or whether it's the form of, whether it's batik, whether it's wow, kreska, all these things, all these tools, um, performances are very important because it is what connects us to our, to the elements and also connects us to our ancestors. So yeah, I think uh, I may have run out of time. I'm just going to end here. But if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Well, now, that was fascinating, <laughs> to say the least. I will give a round of applause for, uh, for Natasha. I think it was brilliant. Um, I mean, some of the things that you mentioned over there was new. Um, before I, uh, I un, un, uh, before I, I begin with some questions for Natasha, I would like to inform everyone who's watching out there, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can post that question in the live feed. Um, it would be great to hear from you. Uh, and so please go ahead and post those questions. Um, so to begin with, Natasha, I have a question. Um, so, or, you know, based on what you said, so when you define spiritualism the way you do, uh, and you describe it the way you do, um, with all, all the explanations, uh, you know, connection with nature and ancestors and etc. Are the conservative elements in society able to appreciate and accept it, especially in Klantan? You'd be surprised in Klantan, yes, but outside of Klantan, Trangano, uh, Kedah, Perlis, and Johor, no, because. Uh, the, the way if you we study if you look back at the history of, of Malaysia Malaya back then right um, we we pushed our development too fast you know we were trying to put ourselves on the we were trying to modernize uh, ourselves we were trying to sort of like push towards westernization we were pretty much along the lines of Mustafa Kemal Tatuk is what he was trying to do with Turkey and um, so in fact uh, what was happening they because in the federal constitution, um, Islam is a natural is, is the uh, national religion. So they were very sort of like um, they were trying to sort of like make people move away, you know, as far as and as fast as possible from from all these spiritual aspects of it. But if you go to Kelantan, if you go to Trangano, you go to Kedah, and you go to Johor, but mainly the northern region, there there's still the, you can still have wonderful conversations with 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 the locals about about arts and craft. So it would seem it would seem that the uh, major angst is with the uh, political class uh, oh, when yeah. it comes to Absolutely. when it comes to these kind of uh, matters. Um, let me just follow this up. Considering the climate of divergence, which you just you know the federal constitution Malay versus the classical Malay, do you see a possibility of convergence? at some point in time? Um, yes, I'm beginning to see that. I can confidently say that now, but maybe 15 years ago, I would say no. And the reason why I'm saying yes is because um, uh, we, we, as in my company, uh, Gahara, uh, as well as, you know, the Malaysian Craft Council, we have actually been in many conversations with a lot of agencies and even hotels, uh, clients who are interested to sort of like bring all of these narratives back into their property. So you'll be surprised to see, you know, where uh, you be, I think you will slowly see um, local arts and craft playing a much more active role um, in, in Malaysia soon. And it has also to do with the fact that our neighboring countries are very much, you know, 
you know, they become so successful with with the way they, they've been uh, marketing their uh, their local okay. arts and craft, yeah. So Malaysia is trying to do that, but at the same time, we've we've had conversations with with even um, uh, even with Motec, you know, saying that you cannot promote local arts and craft without bringing these narratives in. So it's either all of it goes in or none mm-hmm. at all, and they're beginning to see that because another another reason is national pride, because mm-hmm. Malaysia has come to the point where we realize that. We're becoming like we're slowly going to become like America, where you know, if we we, we try to modernize ourselves too much and we try to uh, ignore uh, our cultural legacy, mm. what's what's going to be left? Right. I mean, science, maths, and science can only take us so much. You know, it can only take us that far. But you know, what creates you know the the what do you call it? What gives the pulse? To the country is actually your your the tradition, your history, the culture, yeah. And we have a very rich um, tapestry of that. Okay, so do you think then, based on what you said, are there is there royal patronage for this, you know, arts and culture and and the, the things that you you just mentioned? Uh, and is there political patronage for it? And is it required for it to thrive and survive? Um, the the real the the reality of the scenario right now, I'll share it with you, is that um, there are we do have we have many royal patrons and political patronage into local arts and craft, but I think the 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 way they 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 look at local arts and craft is a form of commodification, it's a form of product. You know, if we can market this product successfully, especially overseas, you know, it's, it's a form of success. So the barometer for success is very different for them compared to if you talk to people within the arts and craft community. The barometer of success for us is when more people, especially the younger generation, are made aware of what comes with these products. These are not just end products. There's a lot of other, we're looking at product and value. So all these things I'm telling you about spirituality is what adds value, what gives value to this product. Otherwise, this is an empty shell, you know? Yeah. So the, the government is now being very uh, participative, actually. They, they're beginning to allow um, more of this narrative to come back into the promotion of local arts and craft. Right. I would think that, you know, being this, 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 this is something that, you know, uh, not just the heritage looks, doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be just heritage of Malay people itself, but it seems to be heritage of a, a lot of different peoples as well, because it's so yeah. commingled. Now, my question is, wh- uh, what role does uh, the royalty play in this? Or do they have a role in this? Because um, the reason I ask this question is because oftentimes I see, you know, in the UK or in uh, in Denmark or wherever, you have these seals that uh, by you know by royal seals that are placed on these products to, or, or companies that seem to produce uh, you know uh, old uh, or heritage kind of work or art uh, you know arts and crafts which they they have this patron and, and because of that that um, that seal or that endorsement from the royalty they seem to get a stipend. Of sorts, uh, so that they can maintain that uh, living style, or you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we need the pet. We we need the support, the patronage of royal royalty, because if you go back to the history, right, um, they are the patron of arts and craft, and they are even the what we call uh, the medium of arts and craft, because. Um, these, for example, some of these performances and, you know, Gamelan, they're all performed at palaces, yeah? And also, um, traditionally, yeah, according to history, um, the royal families also have their own, uh, what do you call it, practices and so forth. Uh, um, and um, it's just like if you study um, Egyptian civilization, you know, how the pharaoh is like one step step below below it's, it's a form of god you know but in in traditional uh, in our hi- local history um royal families they are very imp- they're instrumental 
in in sort of like preserving, in practicing, and in promoting local arts and craft. It's just that today, uh, it's a delicate matter because of the politics when it comes with it. For example, you don't want to be associated to be pushing this too much because then people will be starting to question about all these elements of shirik and haram and this and that. Um, the the climate is shifting, but maybe not in our lifetime. Uh, yeah. I mean, yours and mine, we know it, but yeah. uh, maybe in the next generation. Yeah. But there is a is a better sense of consciousness because now there seems to be a revival in appreciating um, heritage. Mm. I wouldn't go as far as to say ancestral heritage. I would just use the word heritage. Yeah, but um. When it comes to the royal families, they've always been supportive. It's just that, you know, they, they probably do not want to be um, out there. Mm. Just like for us, we have a lot of customers who come from the royal family, and, but we don't expose them. We, we, we keep it private. So there, there's a lot of things that, uh, is, it's, you know, out of, out of respect and practice, we, we don't do. But um, I can tell you that royal families still play a very big role in local arts and craft. Yeah. So it would seem that the royal, with regard to royalty, it would seem that uh, the, the biggest stumbling block would be uh, the perception and, and especially the possible um, uh, way those who are conservative enough may, may seem to equate this to uh, opposing uh, dichotomies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, religion on one hand and then this so heritage of spirituality on the other hand. Okay, I think there are a lot of questions coming in. Um, so sure. before I, I move on, I have several more questions, uh, sure. but, but I'll let the floor. Add, could I add one more one sure. point, Vinod? Sure. I think one way to know that we are we are changing the mindset is when we can have a performance like Ma Yong openly without fear of getting any kind of backlash. I think the day that we are able to do this kind of performances, mm. um, you know, I think we, and, and talk about it, like the, the way the people in Indonesia do, I think that it's a big clear sign that we are moving forward. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I have one last question before I hand it over to Jin Chi for the questions from the floor, um, okay. from the audience. Um, the question is basically, uh, I have a, um, okay, so, you mentioned in your pre-conference meeting about, and you mentioned it here as well, uh, that bate is a resistance art. I'm yeah. having a hard time trying to imagine Che Guevara adorning a bate shirt. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, what kind of resistance art is, do you mean? I mean, is it the you know Che Guevara type resistance or is it some other type of resistance? Okay. So resistance art, you, uh, means it's, it's a form of artwork where the medium that you use it resists the penetration of colors like how we use wax yeah uh, so the the wax when you once we 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 do the design with wax yeah uh, the composition and all that and then we dip it in colors and then we we boil it and then we that's when we, we strip off the wax and then the outline is 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 pretty much what used to be with the wax and um it's it's a form of it's, it's very stubborn. So um, so what the, when we talk about resistant art, right? And, and actually, this has been practiced in so many different countries. You know, it's mm. I mean, batik is just that the design is completely different. You know, mm. and you can see this in South Africa. You can see it in, in all over the, the world. Actually, even the Netherlands. Yeah, but when you when you talk about um, like Che Guevara kind of resistance, it's it's actually a form of yeah, you can say it's it's a form of stubbornness, yeah, and um, resistance. I think it's it's true. Like when you say Che Guevara resistant, as in like revolutionary, trying to change status quo. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, initially, I when when you when you mentioned, so maybe it's my bad. <laughs> I, when I when I heard the word resistance, I, I mean I immediately uh, you know I visualized Che Guevara. But I, in in a sense, you the way the way you're equating it. Now it, it still could fit because I think wearing bate could be a for I mean a statement of resistance. Isn't yes. It? Um, for example, first of all, uh, the batik when you call it for uh, in terms of resistant art, 
you can't pen anything they cannot penetrate to uh, penetrate so it's a form of the resistance in terms of the technique but in terms of attitude yeah, yeah. Um, batik is now slowly being worn, you know, in, in many different ways. Like in Indonesia, you know, you have the younger generation wearing batik on on various uh, on various occasions, but mainly they in the world of fashion, you know, they've they've made it. They, it's so contemporary because it's targeting the European market. And when I was in the US for three years there, every summer, batik prints will definitely be, you know, in the top three designs, and and it's, a, it's known as a summer print. Wow. Yeah? So, yeah, but if you go to Indonesia, yeah, Bate is, is one in so many ways that you can't help but admire their inventiveness and their imagination. In Malaysia, we are beginning to see more people wearing batik. The problem is they don't realize what they're wearing is batik Jawa. They're wearing Indonesian batik. So, this is where the problem comes in, you know, um, and uh, they... I think we need to educate um, uh, our local uh, citizens that the motif and the print, you know, speaks a lot. And you need to understand that when you are wearing a batik from Indonesia, say, for example, yeah, you are not helping to circulate the economy for the local batik producers. So um, that's another thing that, that's becoming a form of resistance for me because I'm not trying to push Malaysian batik to as many, um, you know, uh, vendors and to uh, to as many agencies as possible. In fact, that is why uh, I'm pushing Batik Malaysia into interior. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to hand over the floor to Jinchi because we have a whole bunch of questions coming through and I've taken up too much time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vinod. And um, okay, I'm just going to, we have uh, some questions from the floor. So I'll start with um, Miss Irene Ong. Um, she asked, is it true that the Kuda Kapang dance has also a spiritual element? Absolutely, absolutely. And if you watch it, then you can you will see it because the, the, the dancers, they go into a trance and they will be even kicking. They will be going, they, what they do is they start behaving like horses. And that, and the moment they start doing that, and then the music intensifies the by rhythm and, and, and tempo, then you know that that's when the spirit within the performers is kicking in. Yes. But don't worry, at the end of the performance, the Tokbomo is responsible in diffusing the situation to get the spirits out of every performer. That is the role of the Tokbomo. The top bomo's role is to call the spirits, get into the performance, and to bring them out. That's absolutely. That sounds really interesting, and would be nice to witness that one day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually <really> very fascinating. <laughs> I think we should back onto the topic that you were um just before I asked the question from Irene. Um, you were talking about the batik that we are wearing. All right. Yeah. So this actually um, so happened. We have a question from one of my colleagues, Mike. Um, he asked, what specific type of batik are you wearing? Okay. This is actually uh, a, a type of batik. It's from Indonesia. I have to admit it's from Indonesia, but this is a gift. This is a gift. So the only, uh, I usually wear Malaysia batik uh, as, to support uh, local batik, but the only type of batik print that I that I would wear from Indonesia are usually the ones that are a gift. And that's another thing about batik when it's given as a gift, it it has uh, it is something like in, when people give you a jade as as presents, yeah. Uh, this, but you can see from the design, yeah, you can see that it is very different. Um, but you can also see this um in terms of floral motif, quite identical to um to what we have in Trenggano. But I want to highlight something. This is print. It's not artisanal, handmade batik. Right. So it's not of high value in terms of skill. It's a print. Yeah. So, but what I like about it is that it's, it, again, it's fashion. Yeah. Indonesians have a very good eye for how to fashionize their batik. Yeah. But this is from Indonesia. But it's a simple standard batik that you would find people wear for their sarong. 
Yes, it's very beautiful. Thank you. All right. Um, shall I read another of the questions? One more, which is I actually have three more. So the following one is actually by one of our team members here, Charles. Um, he asked, can spiritual virtues as qualifying factors to learn from uh, learn the arts and crafts be defined as a possibility in redefining the arts and crafts as credible art and design programs? Can you repeat that question? <laughs> okay. Can spiritual virtues as qualifying factors to learn the arts and crafts be defined as a possibility in redefining the arts and crafts as credible art and design programs? Leave it to Charles to come up with such a question. <laughs> Keep it short and simple, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it doesn't work the same way. If we're looking at it from a, you know, like a standard design program, you know, uh, like a, a typical, you know, curriculum offering, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, in, in traditional, uh, in a traditional sense, if you want to study um, local arts and craft, yeah, when we talk about spiritual virtues, sometimes it's not for you to decide as well. You can be very interested to, to learn how to make the crisps and you can seek an Adi Guru, but he may deem you unworthy and it could be something that he sees within you that you can't see. So the same with performances. There are certain things uh, that you you we can't see within ourselves that 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 these masters can see, and um, just like you, they will say sometimes you don't realize that you have the skill, and then and somebody tell comes to you, a master comes to you and say you have the gift for this, and you should explore this. And it has happened to some of my friends. So, and, and then it opens, you know, a third eye perspective. And then your life is completely changed. But when you want to talk about spiritual virtues, you know, as, as a, 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 what do you call it, prerequisite, for example, to a design program, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Very different. So if I very... if I understood the question right. So it's more like a personal journey. It cannot yes. be um, standardized. No. No. Right. Yes, no, that's why that's why I mentioned earlier for for students who are a, a naturally good in design in art or in any form of artistry they should uh, they should do some sort of uh, self discovery you know because there's something within it could be something in their ancestry it could be something that that is unique within them that has just been switched on but uh, yeah Local arts and craft, in the pursuit of it, is a form of self-discovery. It's a journey. So everybody's journey is different. Everybody's story is different. And interest as well, you know, the timing, I believe, as well. Yeah, yes, because sometimes maybe you're interested at a young age to pursue mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, body making. But then for some reason, you never get the opportunity until one day when you're in your, you know, in your 40s or your late 30s, suddenly, boom. Yeah. things happen so that's that's for us it's it's it means the universe has has because we believe that you know timing has already been pretty predetermined so yeah that means that for you to get to that point there were many other experiences that you had to acquire in order to qualify to learn that partic particular skill or art right i think wickram you have a couple of questions at hand as well yep thank you yes Natasha. i do Thank you so much. So question four from um, Tay Lee Ann. She's saying, do you think there's a risk of losing connection with spirituality when the appreciation and knowledge of this culture slowly fades away? Yes, yes, that is true. And the reason why I am very attached to it is because number one, I come, I, I come from a family that is very much into uh, certain rituals and practices. And, uh, my great grandmothers were healers, and so they they, they practice certain things uh, that is passed down uh, in in the family. But at the same time, my grandmother would always tell me stories, yeah, about yeah. about these things. And I I studied um, traditional perform performing arts uh, at university, and uh, I have 
been studying um, the local arts and craft, especially batik, um, you know, for I think uh, for as long as I can remember. And so I believe that that was my my journey as well. You know, I was pretty much nudged towards that direction. And that is why I find it part of my social responsibility, you know, and civic duty to advocate a re-education on local arts and craft. Wow, that, that, that's fascinating. And there's this um, other question from our colleague again, uh, Mike. He's asking, is there really such a thing as a distinctive Bate identity for Malaysia? No, we don't, <laughs> we don't have that. Right. Um, because again, it goes back to the, the politicization of the religious aspect practice in this country um, in accordance to the constitution. Because if you were to look at our motif, it's pretty much floral and geometrical, which is, you know, uh, you, compared to the ones in Indonesia, yeah, they have a lot of mystical creatures and characters, the Garuda and all that. You see characters from the Mahabharata and Ramayana epics. So we, we, we can't have that. Um, and as a result of that, our n narrative when it comes to composition is very, very diluted, if not surface level. That is why when people look at Batik from from other countries, they say, oh, it's so rich, it's so intricate. Yes, because the the, the story that's been, you know, in the in the composition of it, you know, there's so much uh, allowance has been given to for them to be imaginative and all that. Whereas for us, you know, we just have to keep it very simple, you know, and as a and at the end of the day, today, um, everybody when we talk about but it's all about commercial value would this sell would this color sell you know would this print sell and then we're, we're we're looking at two different vegetables you know so whereas in in, in indonesia you know when you look at batik you're like okay where is this batik from like for example penambang has 200 years of history in batik production in malaysia a lot of people don't know that in indonesia you have perkalongan so Knowing where your batik comes from, you know the value that's been applied. And then if you know who is the batik maker, that's another value added. So all of these things, yeah. So it is not just a form of product in Indonesia. For us, it's, the, it's pretty much it. It's just a product, yeah. whether it's pretty or not. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. So now I'll pass it over to Jinchi. Jinchi has more questions. Yes, I have one very interesting question. The last question, I think, um, before maybe one of our colleagues here um, ask you one or two more questions, okay? So this is from Mike again. Um, I think it's a, another interesting question because um, knowing that we are all with digital technology these days, so his question is, with the digital technology pervasion, how do we preserve the very essence and spirituality of batik design for today and tomorrow's generations? That's a very good question, Mike, because that is the dilemma that I'm in for the last one and a half weeks, because that question has come to my table. And uh, because as much as you want to preserve the, the traditional way of doing batik, but innovation, is very important. You don't want, for example, even even my own my own brand. You, you don't want it to become like Nokia. Yeah, you do, you don't want to fall behind innovation. And then at the same time, you know, at the end of the day, it's also about survival. And survival means like you know, sales. And especially with what has happened with this, you know, COVID nineteen MCO, a lot of artisans were were hungry. Yeah. Uh, they were not scared of, of, of being infected. They were more scared of going hungry. So I was presented with this question when I had people come up to me, can we take your print and digitize it? Because, you know, um, this we're talking about sales, we're talking about, you know, high volume and all that. But at the same time, it's also a good way to sort of like be able to push, you know, the, the design and 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 then the, the the batik you know the aesthetic value further you know with the narrative but then again you know we are also taking away we are removing uh, some of the traditional elements so I'm I'm at a crossroad because I believe that digitizing uh, batik is, is one way 
to actually help preserve an interest in batik, especially among the younger generation. It's about combina combining batik uh, as, a uh, as a technique and then how do you con connect it with fast fashion. Um, so how I look at it is like this. I think if you want to to preserve batik, there are certain things that you want to decide what to preserve. Is it, uh, like for example, for Gahara, it is artisanal batik and it is in our coloring technique it is in our block print because our block is actually designed from scratch uh, by our creative designer who's also an artist so but at the same time we can't produce a lot because to produce artisanal batik uh, you, you can't do it takes a long time two to four weeks and it depends a lot on the weather the weather plays a big role in 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 the final aesthetic beauty of a batik piece for example, if it rains, and color absorption and drying time is different. You need strong sun. You need a lot of wind. Uh, so you can design, you can come up with a fantastic composition, but it is again up to the elements to decide on the, on the final beauty uh, aspect. So, but at the same time, if there is a demand, you gotta, you gotta, you know, produce. You gotta produce it faster and more. So. Uh, I'll be very honest, uh, that is a question that a lot of, of us in the industry are asking right now to to pivot uh, and and uh, yes or no, because some of them are like, no, uh, but uh, to to pivot, to agree to it, what, how, what can we do to retain certain aspect? Like for me, one of the things that we need to talk about is actually in terms of um, the pollution. Uh, wastewater management because that is something that we can and we must innovate because if we talk about the triple bottom line of any any um, batik production company uh, people profit and planet you need to consider how to get rid of your wastewater and and right now we're we're working on a, a, a project uh, we're trying to experiment on on how to create an ecosystem using uh, maybe plants and whatnot that can actually that love all this toxic and and then you know do we want to create an ecosystem on that so that's something that's in the pipeline uh on my end for me that is something that we need to talk about and we need to innovate because if you want to it's not so much about digitizing bate but we need to talk about other aspects of bate because the value chain is such that there are so many things in bate making that we need to address that we have not addressed Believe it or not, you know, some, some batik makers, they are still, you know, they, they dispose their wastewater when it's raining heavily so that, you know, people won't be able to see them do this. I mean, we, we still have this, you know, we need to talk about best practices. We need to talk about governance. And, you know, there's so many other things that we can talk about other than digitize, digitizing. Because another thing is about health. I'm also working on how to push for occupational health and safety. For, for local, you know, uh, arts and crafts um, uh, because a lot of them are, are, are exposed to so much, you know, uh, okay. for example, not just the heat, but also, you know, the fumes and all that. So there's so many things that are, to me, that's very archaic that we need to, we need to discuss. Digitizing, okay. but it is not. Right. Um, that was, uh, so, I mean, I think there seems to be a, uh, 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 on one hand, to retain the uh, classicalness of the heritage, and on the other hand, there's this push for modernity, and the tension between the two uh, seems to be a very tricky thing to uh, manage. And I think you seem to be uh, coming through with that particular point towards the last, uh, towards the end. Um, I have to, I have to cut you off at this point in time right now, simply because we have way exceeded the time uh, period. And uh, but this is great because it just shows, uh, I mean, the, the amount of questions, the gravity uh, of the uh, topic. Um, a round of applause, everyone can unmute your mics for um, Natasha. Thank you. Standing ovation. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we do have, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but we couldn't address all the questions coming from the audience. But there is one last question from Martin, uh, which I, I mean, it's a short question, but uh, he just wants to know, uh, uh, could you recommend any reading material that he could like, you know, read 
to 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 know about all the things that you just mentioned okay um one i is i, I won't be able to recommend one but i can re recommend you to a resource center so what you can do is uh martin right go to the national textile museum in kuala lumpur it's the bill it is part of the jalan uh, bangunan sutra bersamaan so there is a resource center and a textile museum go there everything that you would want to know and need to know would be there that will be a good starting point great and, and uh, lastly i would like to tell the audience those of you who have been with us for this uh, short period of time well one hour plus now um to take a survey has been posted uh, in the um, in the facebook in our facebook page so that we can know your thoughts and uh, your experiences and so that we can improve ourselves better um, on behalf of the team and in behalf of our speaker today we'd like to thank you for participating in this uh, first session uh, of the troublemakers assembly for this year um, we, i mean thank you very much and uh, with that i think uh, i will pass the buck back to jinchi because she started so she should end <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Natasha. You, you're our first um, speaker for this month. Oh, and yes, yeah, so we are actually very lucky to have you and we're very happy to see that there are lots of engagement as well. Um, you know, from um, a few at the beginning until now, it's like towards the end, it's like more than 50, 60 plus. So I think it is uh, something optimistic for us to uh, carry on for the next few months. So um, I hope that everyone else will be with us and invite more of your friends to join us for August right up to November for the um, Troublemakers Assembly, um, the next few e-conferences. And I would like to thank my team here, um, Vikram, Charles and Vinod for all your hard work and we will continue to work together for the next few months. Please be on the lookout for more of our announcements and invitations for more e-conferences, um, create trouble. Create trouble everywhere you go. <laughs> and Nat Natasha, more trouble, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. I Thank second you. that. More trouble, Natasha. More trouble. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Hi, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.